Спасибо за Спасибо за предложение. Мне очень приятно. So it's a pleasure to be here. I represent the work by Pablo and my memo teams. Uh, we also have Monique uh, seated in the back. Uh, I think there's a few others as well. Uh, Irina is probably there. Yes, hi Irina. <laughs> Let me the charger. So um, this work is coming out of a collaborative effort uh, from our teams uh, and also my laboratory is a global laboratory between Singapore and uh, MIT. Our work is on solar. Now, um, if you hear people say solar is done, uh, we don't need to work on solar cells anymore, it's already cost competitive. The reason for that is they see headlines in some heavily subsidized manufacturing and installation markets where some very low prices have been met. And um, think of the price at which you can install solar not as a number, but as a bell curve, as a distribution. And what we see is the tip of that distribution starting to hit price competitiveness. So just because you have the tip of the bell curve starting to hit price competitiveness does not mean that everything is over uh, the line, right? If anything, if you think about the vast diffusion model, the technology adoption, we're right here at the very beginning. We're at around one to 2% uh, solar installed worldwide. So we have another one, maybe one and a half orders of magnitude to grow in terms of solar penetration. And the way we're going to get there is by checking off all the boxes here on the chart on the left. All these puzzle pieces need to fit together for an advanced solar technology to be market competitive without subsidies on a global scale. We need to have high efficiencies. We need to have low material costs. Those are very, fairly obvious and we've heard a lot about them. The next ones are important and they're less popular, but they're extremely important. One is the factory needs to be cheap. You need to have low capex. Um, the solar cells need to have low degradation so that banks will come and invest in the, uh, the project. So it needs to be bankable and ultimately scalable with elemental abundance and non toxic. So uh, keep this in your mind. Um, for us guys, uh, which have garnered a lot of attention recently, uh, check out many of these boxes. They're extremely manufacturable. The equipment needed to make them is very, very cheap. The efficiencies are now starting to get into an interesting range, not for the lead-free stable ones, but for the lead-rich uh, ones. But we encounter problems with bankability, with the degradation, and with uh, the scalability to some degree and toxicity of lead. So uh, the big challenge with peroxides right now is to increase um, the stability and to remove the lead from uh, the system. Because this is a short talk, I'll focus more uh, on the second point, on removing lead and achieving high efficiency at the same time. So keep this in mind as we address another problem, which is a slow cycle of learning. One of the reasons why solar and, and many other hard tech uh, areas don't attract a lot of investment from companies and from governments is because of the long timelines needed to begin an investment and reap the benefits. So if we look at uh, common materials that are uh, present today and have changed, transformed our lives, it's taken plus 20 plus or minus five years to bring these technologies into the marketplace. And contrast it with the appetite of investment, government and corporations being around five years max. And then the residency time for personnel and the IT leakage rates being also in the range of two to five years. There's a mismatch of an order of magnitude and speed at the rate at which we develop new things and the rate at which the world demands it. And by world demanding it, we also have uh, a new IPCC report for the 1.5 degree C global warming uh, limit that requires us to have new technologies rolled out, ideally by 2022, so they can be scaled up by 2030 and, and address the uh, global climate change. So in the background, while we're working on new solar materials, what we're also doing fundamentally is trying to change the way we perform research and development. We want to enter a loop, a cycle of learning that's 10 times faster than the way we do research today, which has faster synthesis, faster device assembly, and faster diagnostics. I use the word diagnostics instead of characterization because I'm not just characterizing random things about the material. I want to diagnose what the root causes of underperformance are and then address them. So how do we move forward within this vision? We need to accelerate material synthesis, eventually device and process optimization, and diagnosis. So let me start with point number one. The rate of discovery of new materials um, is proportional to the rate of material screen free in high, that's throughput, how fast you are, 
times the probability of success. So if you think of it from a hockey analogy, since we're in Russia, if you're uh, shooting um, eight times the goal and you score twice, you can increase your throughput and double the number of shots you take per unit time, at which point you double the number of goals you make. Or you can do both, increase your throughput and your probability of success, at which point you end up scoring a lot more goals, right? Six compared to two in this case. So what do we do to do both? Well, we can adopt high throughput synthesis platforms to get us from one to two, and then from two to three, we can use theory to direct us to the most defect tolerant systems. And what I mean by that are the materials that are amenable, that, that can withstand the defects intrinsic to high rate synthesis. Let me expound a bit more about that. If we look at cadmium telluride in blue and perovskites in red, this is the lead halide perovskites, the efficiency versus time. What we notice is that both have tracked similar uh, efficiency improvement curves over the last uh, half a decade. And the work or effort needed to improve the efficiency of the perovskites was around two to three orders of magnitude less than the cadmium telluride. So CatPel required around uh, a million to 10 million current voltage sweeps per percent efficiency improvement, and the perovskites were two to three orders of magnitude lesser. So it's not just we, uh, we, we grow samples faster in the perovskite community. There was something intrinsic about the material that made it more defect tolerant, more amenable to this high rate synthesis platform. And we analyzed the band structures of uh, the perovskite materials and then used that electronic structure information to screen a materials property database called materialsproject.org, scanning uh, over 27,000 inorganic semiconductor compounds using an API interface with the materials database, and identified a few hundred to thousands of candidates, materials, that exhibit a similar band structure to the lead halide perovskites, but don't contain lead. So out of that huge subset of materials, we, we think of it as a funnel, going from 27,000 possible candidates down to a few thousand um, ones that have the right band structure. Now we begin making them in the laboratory. And this was a, a very successful paper in the sense that it validated the prediction based on, on the high throughput uh, screening. We synthesized six materials in six months. This was twisting arms in the laboratory. People said it couldn't be done, it was too fast. We, we got six materials grown in six months, and every single one of them exhibited a minority carrier lifetime greater than one nanosecond, which is a major electronic quality that indicates promise for a solar cell or optical electronic device application. So this one study nearly doubled the number of known classes of thin film compound that have achieved over a nanosecond lifetime. Before that, we had uh, three fives, including gallium arsenide, we had CTPS, uh, we had SIGs, uh, cadmium telluride, and the lead halide perovskites. And here, uh, each of these classes, in the Maya, for example, is a layered structure, are different uh, crystal structures and, and different uh, classes of, of semiconductor compounds. So this was a success, but with a big asterisk on top of it. It was only six compounds out of a list of a few thousand. So there was still that, that very big gap between the experimental throughput and theory. And this is a problem in two ways. Number one, it's difficult to validate the theory. So it's difficult to push information back to theory that can help refine it, right? So the inverse design paradigm will only be, um, shall we say, accepted universally once the theory refines itself to the point where its predictive capacity is exceptional. And it cannot reach that point until the experimental uh, throughput catches up and validates or refutes theory at different points so it can refine itself uh, in its predictive capacity. And secondly, from the obvious point of view, <coughs> we increase our throughput so we can actually get a, a working solar cell. So it brings us to the next point, which is accelerating process optimization. There are um, some universal, uh, hmm, there, there are some universal physics that govern growth of materials in the solution synthesis platform. I come from a physical vapor deposition platform uh, background, and uh, I was always skeptical of solution synthesis. To be honest, I thought the material made out of solution synthesis was junk. It had a lot of oxygen and carbon mixed inside of it. Um, in general, it was poorly characterized. People would claim it to be A, but in reality, it was some mixed uh, material that 
I, I just thought it was, it was very bad science, personally. But uh, the deeper I got into it, I realized that um, it's not bad science, it's just a very complex uh, parameter space. And you need to be able to control a number of variables independently. Uh, so this is just a screenshot from a study on uh, the creation of bismuth-based precursors for solution synthesis, which is a big challenge because bismuth doesn't dissolve readily in water. Its solubility, I think, is on the order of 10 to the minus 9 grams per liter. Um, so it's, it really doesn't dissolve well in the water. Um, if you combine bismuth with the right type of solvent, though, you can get very high concentrations dissolved in liquid form, which you can then use in your growth. And depending on the rate of solvent extraction uh, and the uh, addition of what's called an anti-solvent to precipitate the solution, the bismuth out of solution, you can control film morphology and you can control um, the nucleation behavior of, of this material. In the course of designing these precursors, we were putting together a library, a library of elements that we could access and a library of process conditions so that we could achieve the right morphology of our films, contiguous films, for example. I'm going to skip over some of the material here, but I'm going to emphasize one point. Uh, uh, Keith mentioned this in his introductory talk that investment in infrastructure is very important. Um, we have systematically measured with the stopwatch the time it takes to run through our experimental cycle of learning since 2015. And it's a, a big annoyance to the postdocs because it doesn't lead directly to a science paper and they ask why we're doing this. But over the last three plus years, we have managed to reduce the, the cycle of learning. We have managed to reduce the amount of time necessary to complete a cycle of learning without sacrificing quality, therefore increasing the rate of information, uh, actionable information period of time. And it was done in large part by um, streamlining the manufacturing process flow. It's not something that we typically think about in a university r and setting, but it's something that's extremely important if you want to uh, accelerate the rate of learning. And what that's enabled us to do more recently, uh, this is unpublished work, so I, I can't talk about uh, the details right now, but we went from about one material a month to 35 materials per month, right, which is an order of magnitude improvement. And we can do these types of uh, chain plots or chain diagrams that show um, various uh, precursor inputs on, on uh, the input side, leading to a variety of different uh, materials and ultimately devices on the output side. Um, reaching a throughput of around 400 samples per month, uh, of which around 35 are <coughs> unique and of high quality, right? So you have several rounds of development per material. And in a singular two-month campaign, we managed to produce two new materials that hadn't been reported in literature previously, and additional four materials that hadn't been made in thin film form before. They had only been made in bulk crystals. So in a, the, the, the key point here is that investment in re, accelerating your cycle of learning leads to new science. Any one of those aforementioned six materials could have been its own study, and it will be in the future. Um, a, a student could go spin it off and, and do detailed uh, characterization on a particular material and, and learn more about it. Um, there was unexpected science that we saw in terms of the optoelectronic properties. Uh, bottom line, uh, this, this approach I do feel is, is being validated and accelerating the cycle of learning. Um, let me uh, quickly go to the last point, which is um, diagnosis. Uh, how do we accelerate the rate of information from the material. It's not enough just to make materials faster. You have to have uh, the ability to extract actionable information that will improve the next round uh, of, of device fabrication and ultimately tell you when to keep pushing and when to let go. That's what we want to know, right? We want to know, do we, do we keep pushing on this material or do we abandon it? And if we keep pushing, what is the next thing we need to work on? So in a solar cell, uh, the output of a solar cell diagnosis one of the outputs is a current voltage curve, and it's shown right here in the dark and in the light. And embedded in that curve are about 100 bulk and interface properties. So it's very difficult to uh, pinpoint with surgical precision what is going wrong in an early stage prototype device. And that's because, well, it could be any one of these bulk and interface properties that are affecting the performance of your solar cell. So what to do? We realize that information is embedded in every point along the current voltage curve, but typically we only look at three of them because we're limited by 
our creative capacity to, to take many data points together and rectify them with a device model. But computers can do that well. So what we did is we developed a technique known as current as a function of voltage, temperature, and injection dependence. And this technique hasn't been around for a while. What we invented was a Bayesian inference algorithm uh, wrapper on this experimental technique. And uh, the way it works is, is like so. We have your solar cell device that has something wrong with it. We don't know what yet, and we're trying to diagnose what's wrong. We acquire non-destructive rapid electrical measurements, current voltage curves, in high succession using different temperatures and different illumination intensities. So we acquire a lot of data. We have a physics-based model that solves the drift, diffusion, and continuity equations for electrons and poles inside our solar cell. And then we're reconciling both the electrical and the modeled results, so the observations and our model using the Bayesian inference algorithm, which is designed to do exactly that. It's designed to update a probability of a certain thing being uh, uh, true or false or having a certain value on the basis of one new piece of information you acquire, on the basis of one new electrical measurement you obtain in your system. And the way the data will look is it will evolve from a, a, a flat random probability distribution function to a concentrated probability distribution function around ideally a singular value or range of values. So we probed four parameters of interest in an early stage photovoltaic device. We probed the electron selective contact energy difference between the contact and the absorber ball. That's a measure of contact quality. We measured the, or we, we determined the surface recombination velocity at the interface, the bulk minority carrier lifetime, and bulk mobility to transport properties inside the solar cell. And here's the data coming in in real time. On the upper right, we see uh, the entropy of each variable, each of those four, uh, dropping with observation number. And as we take more and more data into account, the entropy drops. And meanwhile, what we see is the probability distribution functions for the four different variables converging in some cases on singular values, in other cases on near mid-range, and in other cases not converging at all. And when we plug these PDFs, probability distribution functions, or more precisely uh, probability mass functions, into a uh, forward model, into a solar cell device simulator, we find that these three variables are not limiting solar cell performance, but this one over here is limiting our solar cell device performance. In other words, you can transform this into a sensitivity analysis and determine the variable that impacts device performance. So what this allows you to do is pinpoint with precision what you have to improve in your next round of solar cell fabrication. And in terms of time, it takes about one-tenth the time of traditional spectroscopy. So if I wanted to answer what limits my device using traditional spectroscopy on the top there, I would run Hall, inverse photo emission, one and two photon timers all for luminescence. It would take seven samples and about 100 plus hours to do all of the measurements and all of the uh, data analysis, assuming you have back-to-back -back access to all of the tools, which we hardly ever do. There's scheduling involved. And in the case of this JDPI with the Bayesian inference group, we reduced that to under 20 hours. Uh, a lot of it is dedicated to the uh, computation itself. And we have one solar cell device. So we're measuring all of the layers in the device architecture. The big advantages of Bayesian inference over, say, a multivariate fitting. Why not just use multivariable fitting? Um, multivariable fitting does not take the, the uh, probability distribution functions into account. Uh, in other words, it provides you a number and, and some uh, error, perhaps. Uh, number two, the correlations between variables are not ascertained. So, for example, in here, um, you can see very clearly the uh, new Cal product, the current voltage uh, product um, uh, effect here. And um, number three, a Bayesian inference wrapper allows you to separate out measurement uncertainty from model uncertainty, what we call Elias work and, um, and uh, say, stochastic uh, uh, error. So um, to, to, to bring this into some sort of conclusion, um, I want to paint a picture where the rate of learning uh, is limited more by human imagination than it is by the rate of your resources, right, than the uh, rate of the equipment. Where if you have an idea, you can very rapidly bring it to fruition. Today what we have is the human mind 
in the loop, uh, being a big bottleneck. Uh, I'm currently traveling. My student needs to talk to me to run the next experiment to figure out what this research result meant. I'm traveling to Moscow. I can't answer her email right now. I have to wait until I get back. Um, and then the synthesis and the diagnosis is often slow and imprecise. So what we want to do is work our way toward a future where the human mind is involved in cycles of learning which can be semi-automated or even fully automated toward particular target production functions using AI and high-throughput experimentation to ensure high quality and high rate of learning simultaneously. There is a lot of uh, other exciting results that um, the uh, export control didn't allow me to talk about yet, but hopefully published in the next uh, six months. So just in conclusion, um, there is a search ongoing for the next generation PD absorber material that checks off all the boxes. That's high efficiency, lead free, low cost, high reliability, etc. Um, demonstrated a few different areas where this combination of high, high performance computing, machine learning, and automation, I think, can help. One is in the down selection of possible candidate materials to the few that uh, may ultimately lead to high performance uh, solar cells. Um, number two is in the experimental screening of those uh, candidate materials in a high throughput way. And number three is in the diagnosis of early stage prototypes so we can pinpoint with surgical precision what needs to be improved in the next round of device fabrication. And uh, going into this work was uh, a lot of effort from various different people um, and uh, I'll leave here for questions, so thank you.
you know, one of the things that killed the anarcho business was this, you know, idea that the processability would buy you everything, right? You could make these beautiful things films like processable plastics, and you know, they just upscaled this using this Polaroid plant and were able to make devices somewhere on the order of 14, 18 percent you know, some blanks, and they were sought certified. So, uh, those were very complex architectures in a sense, very difficult materials diagnosis problems, right? For instance, this thin film fill factor versus film thickness. So people didn't even understand how the mechanism worked for why there was high fill factor of thicker films and this sort of thing. And it, it, it became, the, what we saw in the inside of this is really down to the insolubility of the polymer uh, bulk heterojunction processing to whether it was realizing thicker films or thinner films. In your particular scheme where you're looking at thinner films, can you comment about, <coughs> again, the processability, now you're doing solution processing to make thin films, right? Is there still a lot of parameters that have to be optimized in between that? Yeah, so um, I, I appreciate the question from so many different perspectives. Uh, number one, I worked just up the street from Canarca uh, at Evergreen Solar. And um, we were both taking different paths to get to this endpoint. Um, and I agree with your, exactly your assessment of where they fell short um, in looking at processability. We, um, in, in a discussion with Christoph's, Christoph Robich's team, uh, who's the CTO of Canarca for a while, um, during the formative years, in, in Nuremberg this summer in July, it, it, it emerged from the discussion that um, there, there's, there's some division of multi-variable parameter space where you optimize for efficiency alone, and probably a much narrower window of multi-variable parameter space where you're optimizing for manufacturability, which means uniformity. It means um, not only uniformity spatially, but uniformity from a, 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 a statistical distribution of output point of view. And um, not enough academic research has been done into the latter. A lot of academic research was done into the former. Um, and so, if I look back at the, some of the papers we've been publishing recently, uh, looking at these lead-free perovskite inspired materials, it really does focus on process window. Right? It's, it's how do you control, how do you give yourself the most latitude possible to grow a high quality thin film? And efficiency is almost coming as a secondary consideration relative to the manufacturability consideration. I mean, the, the two are of equal importance. You can't get a high performance solar cell without both. But uh, it, it is a perspective worth looking into. Okay, well, I, I think we have a break. Let's thank Tony again and I'm sure we can.